people might think that Gen Z or the youth are lazy or entitled or this or that. That's totally false, completely false. 70 to 80% of our staff right now is Gen Z. We have 22 and 23 year olds running critical departments in our company and doing a phenomenal job and working out better than, you know, 30, 40, 50 year olds. So I would say don't fall into that false sort of phrasing or, or methodology that they're lazy. It's absolutely not true. Welcome to RevOps Champions, a podcast designed for revenue professionals looking to advance sales and marketing initiatives through the role of RevOps within their organizations. In each episode, we feature leaders who are leveraging technology to drive operational efficiency, revenue, and improve the customer experience. Listen in and learn how to become a better RevOps leader within your own organization. Let's get started. Mark, I am so happy to have you here today with me for this episode of RevOps Champions. And a quick shout out to our, our new mutual friend, Ryan, for introducing us after you were on his podcast, Intentional Growth. And I'm not sure how long after, but it's not, it felt to me like it was very soon after you were on his podcast. He sent me an email in introducing me to you saying, you know, you guys have got to get together. So um <laughs> Glad to be here. Th thanks so much for, for joining me. Ah, no. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Good stuff. Let's, Mark, let's dive right in because we want to try and keep these episodes as, as tight as we can. I want to start with, if you could just tell us, you, you know, your career story up until today, you know, where did you start that led to you to where you are today in your professional career? You want to keep this short, you said? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, take as much take as much time as you need. I guess I'll go back to uh, university, graduating college. Actually, I graduated Bentley College, which is now Bentley University, back in 1992. And from there, it was uh, the 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 economy wasn't that great, so I had either had a choice of going to work for Staples, which many of my classmates wanted to do, for I think it was twenty four thousand dollars a year, or go back to work in construction, which I absolutely hated. But I was making well over 40000 and I could also do what I really wanted to do was, was become a sports agent. So I was a sports agent mm -hmm. on the side, and I was a construction worker during the week. And, but that enabled me, my father uh, you know, enabled me to, to travel, to go all over the world and build my business. So you know, right after, about two years after you know, going to work for my father in construction and thoroughly hating it, I was full-time in the sports business. So I had uh, I built a pretty good business. I, I was representing, it was seven NHL players at the time and then another 35 minor leaguers. So National Hockey League is the top and you're in Minnesota, Brandon. So I think you, you know yeah, what, you know what hockey, hockey is, we call yeah, it. That's right. You know what hockey's all about. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, got it. Yeah. So anyway, so, you know, it, and then it happened in, I think it was 1998, where it, within one year's time, I had lost two of my top clients, lost or stolen, whatever it is, or, uh, you know, I fumbled them away, whatever it is, but I lost 30% of my revenue, like out of the gate. So, you know, when you get a 30% wow. revenue hit, you sort of look at the business itself and you sort of look at what you're doing and, and you're, you question it and you say, look, and, and then it was at the same time that I met a guy in the payments business and payments is like PayPal or Stripe or. And this guy was, he had about 2,000 clients. He was my age. He was, we were about 28 years old at the time. And he was making about $30,000 a month recurring revenue. So I saw the recurring revenue piece and I was like, wow, if you lose two clients, you really don't care. It really doesn't dent your, your revenue, your profitability. But the fact that I lost two clients hurts big time. And you didn't have to travel over the world and you didn't have to run around everywhere. And, and what was once a glamorous business for me, which was the sports business, hanging around with pro athletes was awesome, quickly became right. sort of a, a nightmare. And I, I made the switch. I made the switch to payments. So, you know, uh, so I jumped in the payment space and had a bunch of big successes in the space. I was able to sell that company uh, and then launch another one with, uh, with a couple other guys and sell my shares in that in 2006. And then in 2006, 2007, 2008, you remember those years, I think, Brendan, we all do. Yes. Yep. <laughs> very, very, very much. I, I took all, I'll call it all my winnings from my sale in 2006 at one of the companies that I uh, helped found and rolled it all into, uh, into real estate. So I, I would, after that experience, I would say never go all in on something at, at, at the wrong time. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I had a disastrous a couple of years and actually 
on the verge of bankruptcy in 2008 and had to make a choice. I had to, you know, get off my couch, get out of anxiety, get out of depression and make something happen. So I picked up the phone and 87 calls later, I got something done and, and, you know, launched back into the payment space in 2009. So for, uh, for several years from 2009 to 2016, ran a very successful, uh, highly profitable business and, and sold my shares in 2016. Did very well and then took a small portion of that and in 2017 launched a digital marketing company with, with my business partner and didn't roll all of it in, Brendan. <laughs> so uh, we've had huge well, success and this year has been, that last year was phenomenal and we're you know out of the gates very, very well this year. Yeah. No, I mean, it, I, I was so impressed when, when Ryan introduced us and then of course you and I chatted last week, you know, at what you've been able to do in this short amount of time. It's, it's incredible. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Maximedia? Yeah, sure. So we're a performance marketing company. We, we focus on driving traffic to high revenue verticals, I'll call it. So for example, our, our main focus is education and lending in uh, insurance as well. And we drive tons of traffic to, to large, large clients. And so from 2020 to 2021, we actually 8X our EBITDA, 5X our revenue, and it's been phenomenal. And we're, we're looking to, we're on pace to 3X this year. So it's pretty good. 300% is not bad. Oh, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it blows any sort of benchmarks out of the, out of the water. So, which is, which is why I was so excited to, to be connected to you and try and dig into a little bit. And we will, we'll get into that a little bit here now. So. One of the things, when I asked you this question, little did I know that you'd actually written a book that had this word in it, but I ask every one of my guests now, you know, what is your formula? Because everyone I'm speaking to has been successful uh, either leading or being a, an integral part of, of scaling a business or multiple businesses. And I call, of course, that a, you know, everyone has a formula. I'm seeing a lot of common threads in these formula, which is in these formulas, which is great. But of course, I'm always looking for a little bit of a variance. Little did I know, of course, when I asked you that question, you'd actually written a, a best-selling book uh, <laughs> called The Lucky Formula, which we, we'll get into in a little bit. And of course, you were so you were so humble that you didn't even you know let me know how you know what a big deal it, it is or was. But I asked you, like I asked everybody else, you know, what is your formula for success? And you know, you shared with me four things that you think are essentially your formula for growing and scaling a successful business. Do you want to share with me what those, what those are? Well, there's actually more than four, but I can, I can, I actually have 20, but we'll start with four. <laughs> right. Well, and, and this is kind of because when we spoke last week, you know, I hadn't yet downloaded the lucky formula because I figured that was going to be the quickest way for me to sort of look at it a little bit. And I realized, of course, you know, it's a little more complex, but you know, when you, when you're doing a 35 or 40 minute, you know, show or interview, you kind of want to look at the big buckets, right? That's right. But I'm sure, I'm sure each of these have a lot of more detail. So look, the, the formula for a successful business, I think that's the question, right? The formula for a successful business is, is a number one, your people. And so I'll give you a story around that. So it was back in after I came off my colossal mega failure in real estate and we launched in 2009. So I launched a, a business called Evo Canada and we grew from, it was March of 2009, fast forward to December of 2010. So about a year and a half later, we grew from, from myself, you know, one person to over 215 people in a year and a half span. And at that wow. time, I would say that I really didn't understand how to run a business, even though it might on the surface look like it. I didn't really know how to run a business because I had, uh, I had my hand in everything. So I'm sitting at my desk in December, 2009 with about a thousand unopened emails, stressed out of my mind and basically ready to hang up the skates. Like we say in hockey, I was ready to quit the business. And, you know, you might look at that and say how ridiculous that is, but you know, I started the business a year and a half earlier and I want to quit already. But the reason was because I was so stressed out. I didn't know really how to run a business at that size and that scale as the leader. I had done it back in, in 2000, 2006. We grew from three people to 240, but I was just running the sales side. But now in this case, I was running everything. So the mm. first key to growing a successful business and a sustainable business is the people. I call it the, the entrepreneur's dilemma. So often, and it's in the book, and uh, I think I coined that phrase, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it, Brendan. I don't know if I did, but I'm, I'm going to say I did. <laughs> well, but, as far as I'm concerned, it's yours. Yeah. All right, good. But uh, anyway, so the entrepreneur's dilemma is often 
a company or a founder thinks they need to be the center of attention, the center of focus, the center of everything and understand and know everything that's going through the company. So that was exactly me. I needed to know everything in customer service and customer support in in sales, in operations, in legal, in finance, in, in every aspect of the business. So I was on every single distribution list and I was just mm-hmm. overwhelmed and swamped and, you know, come to find out after hitting that wall in December, 2010, and then seeking out a mentor that, you know, the fault was mine, number one, because I didn't have the right people around me. I didn't have the right go-to people. So if you have to do everything, that means you don't have the right people. You should be doing what you do best. And that's what I learned over the years, right? So that, that, that's the first real way to scale a business highly successfully is the right people. You should not have to do sales and marketing and customer service and legal and, and, and put the right people in the right place. But a question, totally. Brendan, I often get is, okay, what about when you're starting out? You can't have those kind of people. Yes, you're right. But you have to work your way into it. Right. You have to work your way Absolutely. into a position where you're doing what you do best and let go of your ego. So another key factor is letting go of your ego. Allow mm-hmm. the salesperson or the marketing person that's better than you at that job to do their job. And when you let people do their job and you let people spread their wings, they'll number one, be loyal to you. And number two, they'll do a great job because they'll love their job. So, but if you're hovering over them or you have your thumb on them, it's just not going to work out. And you're, you're going to have high turnover and not get the right people. You're going to get yes men as opposed to, you know, or yes men or yes women as opposed to, you know, rock star entrepreneurs in their own right. And so that's right. two. I've got, uh, you know, another way is constant education. So if you can see my huge bookshelf, you can't see it, but it's on that side of the camera. But it's, it's constant education. It's constant, you know, learning. Uh, it's constant putting yourself in a position to be taught a new thing. So go to events all the time. So free, I'll just give you a crazy example. I was at uh, Dave Asprey's biohacking event back in September. And from mm-hmm. there, you learn, you learn all about nutrition and fitness and, you know, keeping your body at the optimum level because you as the leader, and, and that's also in my book, your energy level has to be 10 on. I remember years ago when I, we first started that company in 2001, myself and the, and the founder would go to lunch every single day and we'd have a massive lunch with a dessert every time, <laughs> right? So yep. not, not only did I crash at my, uh, I, I had a couch in my office, not only was I crashed out for about a half an hour to an hour after that meal, I started to gain weight and get sluggish and my was affecting my sleep. And so your energy levels are key. So, you know, that gets back to learning how to be a top, you know, a 10 on 10 energy leader. And, and that goes to education as well. And then, you know, another main point is, is taking action. So taking action right. on, I'll just give you an example. Like sometimes, you know, Brendan, I think, you know, a lot of people are, are procrastinators, right? Or perfectionists. So procrastination and perfectionism is actually the same thing. Yep. Guilty. Yep. Are you a perfectionist? I kind of thought so. <laughs> no, 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 I'm well, more a pro- procrastinator, oh. but we'll get into that at a different time because, you know, I don't know if you've heard, if you've heard Patrick Lencioni's latest deal or if you know anything about him, you know, the I, five I dysfunctions of a team. Okay, I, I don't. so he's most highly rated business writers uh, and consultants in the U.S. Uh, his most famous book is "The Five Dysfunctions of a Team," okay, which talks about a lot of the stuff that you're talking about now too. But he, you know, over the last twenty years since he launched that book, he's launched you know one or two more books, and as he's been working with clients, he started to see some some patterns, and it comes back to the point that you made about everybody playing to their strengths, and he's he boiled it down. And it it starts to look a little bit like all the other, you know, strengths finders and disc and predictive index and culture index and, you know, all these other kind of personality tests. But, but it's a really, I've been using it now for a couple of months and it's a really useful tool. And he narrows it down to six things and everybody can identify what these six things are. Two of them are in your area of genius. Two of them are things that you might even be good at, but they don't really energize you for a long period of time. And then the last two are things that you, if you could never do those again and ever, you'd be the happiest person, right? And and it's, he calls it, the six geniuses are, they the acronym is widget. So it's W-I-D-G-E-T. W is wonder. I is invention. D is discernment. G is galvanizing. E is enablement. And T is tenacity. So when you put together a team, you need to make sure that you have people who have at least one of all six areas of genius. And he says, you have to have all of them. And a procrastinator 
like myself. So my two areas of genius are wonder and invention. But that means I don't, I'm really bad at tenacity and enablement. So I need to put, I need to surround myself with people who are strong at tenacity and, and enablement. Fortunately, my wife is one of her geniuses is, ten, is tenacity, so that works. Anyhow, but it's you know at the end of the day, I, to me, that's what resonates most with me on this whole people thing. Is first of all, you got to know yourself, which is actually my theme for this year is is know yourself or know thyself is the original term. And because it, yeah, until you know yourself, you're not able to know you know the people around you. And then that way, I feel a big part of my job is designing teams based on everybody's strengths or geniuses. Absolutely. And then you're going to have a happy workforce. You're going to have a happy team and, and you'll grow, you know, greater than you would without that, that system. I agree with hundred percent. So good. Yeah. Anyway, so that was a bit of a, a, a side note, but I wanted to make sure I, I didn't distract you from your, your areas of formula because the, the other two that you mentioned to me were technology and then you kind of had a grouping of what you called mentors, partners, and and networks is kind of how I noted that. Or did you still want to talk more, a little bit more about the entrepreneur's dilemma? Well, yeah, I think I covered that pretty well, but there's also, I mean, I can go on for hours and hours, but there's also the, the lucky formula itself. It's uh, external condition mastery plus internal condition mastery plus action equals luck. So it's I plus E plus A equals luck. And, and wrapped in there is everything you, you just discussed. So there, there's about 20 points in, in there. And so cool. we, we can go on for hours, but. Yeah, we'll make, we'll make sure we put a, a note to that because actually I, I have the Kindle version of that and, and that's the page I'm on right now. Because, because obviously that's, I mean, that's really what it's all about, right? That's right. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we share a link to that, to the lucky formula. Awesome. Thank you. Good stuff. So, so tell me a little bit how you think about technology as part of the the formula to to successfully scale. Well, I'll, I'll give you a just a small example. I mean, so I I wouldn't say I'm a tech guy in any way at all, but you know, I, I look for things to optimize my life. But one thing is, is I'd been introduced to Calendly about a year ago, and I didn't think that I didn't think that I needed it. I thought that you know. Send me three times at work for you, Brandon, and you know we'll schedule a, a meeting. But after a while, and after being at, uh, so I'm part of Strategic Coach with Dan Sullivan, and oh, you are, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm part well, of that's Coach. A, that's a that's a whole other conversation. Which yeah. we'll, we'll get we'll get to it another time. <laughs> but I, I was sitting next to a gentleman. He's like, dude, you you're, you don't use Calendly? I'm like, no, nah, I I think I get. He's like, the the stat is there's seven and there's about I think six or seven back and forths before you actually schedule a meeting. Just try it. So I, so I broke down and I tried it and I was like, wow, <laughs> this is, it, it's stress less actually just send out your calendar. Somebody books a calendar, you get the notification and boom, it's done. So, I mean, that's, Correct. that's a small, crazy example of how technology can help you. Here's another, another example, even in through strategic coach as well. So there's a gentleman that's in the AI space. So he under, he, he basically takes mundane tasks of your team. And uses AI to to basically get rid of those mundane tasks and make you, you more efficient, more get into the creative zone rather than the the mundane task zone. So we're going through that mm -hmm. process, and I believe that you know if you're if you can optimize your business using technology, your life and your business, then you're going to be able to focus in the areas that you want to focus. Again, we get we're getting back to what you want to focus on, and mm -hmm. technology does that for you. You know, we're in the media buying space, so technology obviously helps us. You know, predictive algorithms help us, media buying, any any technology that can help us get the edge on our on our competitors, if you will, or, or you know, get the edge to drive revenue higher, we definitely mm -hmm. use. So we're in that space. So I yeah, I agree that technology, you know, every industry's got its own, let's say, tech that they can use, but I would highly suggest that anybody focuses on optimizing via technology and not be afraid of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that that's how we wrap it up here is we call it embracing technology, you know, and people are, you know, the, the, the audience of this show is probably sick of me talking about this because the, the analogy I always use is, you know, we, we moved from the stone age to the iron age, not because we ran out of stones, right? So evolution of humans always continues and it's always been driven by technology. Now, obviously iron versus stone didn't really seem like a technological revolution, but it absolutely was. And and you just mentioned AI, which of course 
a lot of people believe is the biggest invention since the creation of fire, right? And it has to have an impact on our lives and therefore it has to have an impact on our businesses because as consumers, we're changing. Our buyer behavior is changing because there's analog technology, which means that businesses have to change how they market and sell and connect with their customers, which again is caused and enabled by technology. That's right. So obviously that's an area that we're very passionate about because that's what we you know, essentially help our clients do is make sure that they have the technology systems to to run their businesses as efficiently as, as they can and actually using technology to align their, you know, their what we call their revenue operations team, which of course is what we're going to get to next. Right. Perfect. Yeah. So let's, let's, so let's move on to that. So to switch gears, I, I know when we first chatted, I wasn't sure how familiar you were with RevOps, but I'll ask you again, I mean, how familiar are you with RevOps or at least the philosophical approach of RevOps as a go-to-market well, well, model let, or strategy. Let's put it this way. Prior to to meeting you, Brendan, I didn't know about RevOps. <laughs> after meeting yeah, you, I, I did, get that a lot. I did a bit of reading on it and uh, I'm, I'm familiar with it, but I think that we intuitively do a lot of the things that RevOps, you know, teaches or, you know, that, the, the yeah. philosophy is. So that's what, and I've heard that pretty much every time I've had a guest who says, well, until I met you, Brendan, I hadn't heard of RevOps. But then as we've dug into it, it's like, well, we're probably doing 80% of what you talk about in, in RevOps. So, and that's exactly what you've, what you've said. It's like, we, we don't call it that, but yeah, that's essentially what we're doing. Give or take a few things, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And that's yeah. the way I looked at it. I mean, it's basically aligning your, your sales, your marketing with your technology, with your, your uh, back office or back end or, um, you know, back office, I'll call it. So it's aligning mm-hmm. the, whole, the whole organization together. And I think, you know, we, we do that through many, you know, we have many different uh, areas, many different tips and tricks and what we do to get our, get our teams aligned from compensation to, you know, to little things like we have a, a leadership call every week. And the leadership call, basically, I run the leadership call and I have our, our top leaders run the call. Every other week we switch off, but we basically mm-hmm. empower and enable people from all departments to, you know, have the stage front and center and to be become leaders and, and show off their leadership. And look, the way we treat our employees is by empowering them. I mean, I it baffles my mind how, I don't even want to talk politics, but how, how politicians act versus how, let's say, businesses that are, that are highly profitable act. It's so different. And, you mm-hmm. know, and in politics, you don't empower, you don't lead with positivity. You basically disempower and backstab and that's absolutely not what we do whatsoever. So, you know, we're aligning everybody together through empowerment, through positivity, through coaching, through teaching. And, you know, it just basically filtered through the whole organization. And I would say that's definitely why our, our revenues and our EBITDAs, you know, had such tremendous growth. I mean, we've gone from in a two and a half year span, four employees to over 300. So I would say, you know, we're probably using RevOps and, and maximizing all aspects of it. Yeah, and and I think this is what's what's so fascinating about this is because I think you and and many other leading businesses who've been able to scale the way that you have in the last five years have just figured this out. But what a few people did is like we're seeing a successful businesses doing this. What does that look like? And it and it's all I mean, it's sort of back to this you know formula question. I th- I think what's what's happened is there's a community of us who who are essentially creating this formula as we go. And we, we're calling it RevOps and revenue operations because that's exactly, but what you said is, you know, you're aligning your people, you're aligning your processes between those people in those teams. You're then aligning the data, so the metrics, KPIs, from the highest level business goals through what is the what is sales' metrics, what are the marketing metrics, what are the customer success or metrics, et cetera. And then the last piece is the technology systems that, that drive all that to make the, the people, the processes, and, and the data accessible, aligned, integrated, so that the leaders of, of the company or the leaders of the department can make better, faster decisions, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's great to hear. And, and again, I like your unique take on how you explained that, because I think you're spot on. So let's, let's keep going. So, you, I mean, you said to me that you don't, again, you don't use the, the term uh, RevOps, but why do you think... That's that this is an important approach to have a, a model or a strategy like this. Well, I mean, we, we just went through this uh, year end. So we went through our 2022 goals and targets. And each goal and target, 
you know, requires specific actions from everybody in the organization. So if we're going to hit our, our target is they hit a hundred million dollars in revenue this year. And mm-hmm. I think it's, it's highly possible. So if we're going to do that, you know, wow. our creative team needs to, you know, needs to produce X amount of creatives. Our media buying team needs to be buying at a, a 50% ROI or ROAS, you call it in marketing. You know, our, our operations team needs to make sure that everything runs flawless. Our tech team needs to make sure. So we've got it all mapped out on, you know, everybody's rules, responsibilities, targets, targets from, from many different aspects like revenue percentage ROI, number of, let's call it widgets that are produced from the creator side. And, and, you know, we've got it all laid out. So I think that's RevOps, I believe, to a T. Well, yeah, it, it's absolutely. And, and, and that's, of course, the measurement part of RevOps is how you then use all that data as your scorecards and whatever to make that's better decisions. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, there was, there was one thing that I wanted to pick up in there, but I'll come back to that. So let's, so moving on. So you, you've already shared a couple of challenges Mark, but because we all know, yeah, those of us who've been there and you and I talked about, you know, the the similarities of what happened to us back in 2008, where I shared with you also that, you know, my wife and I started a, a business in 2007 when we moved from Africa to Spain on the crest of the wave and started a real estate business, which of course, you know, a year and a half later, we pretty much lost that business in, in 48 hours. And I was having all the same conversations that you were at that point, you know, asking friends and family for advice. Which, of course, is then what finally led to where we are today at, at Dynamico, because at this at that very time, it just happened to be one of the greatest opportunities and pivotal moments towards a digital, a more digital world with the launch of the, the iPhone. Facebook became a thing. You know, everything was just happening right then. And we knew that that small and, and mid-sized businesses were going to struggle to figure that out. Uh, again, back to what I was saying earlier, you know, as technology was now impacting how buyer behavior, how a business is going to adapt to stay connected and, and be successful doing, you know, marketing, sales, et cetera. So that's, and that's, you know, we've been doing that now for 12 years. And the only thing that's really changed is the velocity of change of the technology. So it just becomes an even bigger need. But I, what I wanted to get to you was you should one or two bigger challenges, but do, any other challenges that you'd care to share that, you know, along the way before you had the overnight success? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, look, every day is a challenge, but I'm going to say that I wouldn't say it's a, yes, it's a challenge. So when you're growing a business, when we decided to, to blitz scale, right? So we call it blitz scaling. It's a book uh, written mm. by, it was the gentleman that wrote it. Um, it. It's the founder of LinkedIn. Anyway, so he wrote Chris Ye. That's right. Chris Ye wrote it with the founder of LinkedIn. Anyway, so I read that book and I was like, you know what? We're going to blitz scale this business. We're going to do this. So we scaled very quickly from four to 30 and then from 30 to about 75 and then some, from 75 to 150 and from 150 to 300. But along the way, the challenges are you're going to hire the wrong people. You're definitely going to make some mistakes. And the quicker you grow, the more mistakes you make. So you have to, you have to make quick, fast decisions on letting those people go. If it's not the right, if it's not the right fit culturally. If it's not the mm-hmm. right fit, you know, energetically and just energetically and culturally are the two key, key factors, then you have to move on. And, you mm-hmm. know, there's going to be fires burning all the time. Expect it and, and just make those hard decisions. So, you know, a leader needs to be first a visionary, but they also need to make hard decisions and, and have those tough conversations. And those, look, they're right. not, they're not easy, right? I'm sure you've had those, Brendan. Those convers- <laughs> yeah, right. But those conversations are tough. It's the old, look, we need to go in another direction. We made a mistake and we have to move on. So, you know, that, that's a mm-hmm. challenge, you know, getting the right people on board. But if you have the conviction to only work with the right people, it'll work out over time. And so, that, you know, that's one of the challenges. But I will say that here's another kind of insight. People might think that Gen Z or the youth are lazy or entitled or this or that. That's totally false, completely false. Absolutely. 70 to 80% of our staff right now is Gen Z. We have 22 and 23 year olds running critical departments in our company and doing a phenomenal job and working out better than, you know, 30, 40, 50 year olds. So I would say don't fall into that false sort of phrasing or, or methodology that they're lazy. It's absolutely not true. The right ones are great and the wrong ones are lazy. So, so make sure you, right. you, you know, hire and, and move on quickly if, the, if it's not a good, uh, good fit. Yeah. And and again, I think that 
maybe is linked back to the entrepreneurial dilemma, right? Where, which is kind of like the, the e-myth, you know, which of course is still probably one of the best selling, you know, business books where entrepreneurs start a business, but they don't really realize what, what they're getting themselves into. And one of those things is, so you mentioned good fit. A, a lot of entrepreneurs, when they get to that point of growing, whether they're a 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 or whatever the number of people, and they have to start making those hard decisions, that fit is a two-way thing. They're, you're potentially doing that person a huge favor. It's by finding them a better place to uh, that's right. to go, that's right? That's a very good point. It's, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I was at a conference last month where there was a, a speaker on like family dynamics in, in like whatever, for whatever reason. And the, the best thing she said, and I immediately brought that back into the sort of the business sort of world, was that who in the room doesn't have a messy family situation? And of course, how many hands went up, right? And she said, so the best thing you can do is just accept the fact that families are messy. And I think, and I, the, th the first thing I thought of myself once I'd gone through the family thing was like, but that's, that's exactly how business is. Business is messy. So just get that out of the way, make sure everyone's aware of it and, and then, and then figure it out. Right. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So I guess we, we touched already, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about technology and we, we've, which we've touched on a little bit and we don't need to get into more. You mentioned mentoring, which I think again, is part of that whole being a better leader and manager and allowing you know people to grow. So we, we don't necessarily get into, into that. But before I ask you the last question, Mark, which is a, a tip for, for the audience, is there anything else that, that you'd like to share? I mean, on any particular topic, anything at all? Any, just anything. Well, yeah, anything that, that you think might somehow tie back to what we're talking about, which is how to successfully scale a business or what, what to watch out for, because that's why people are listening and, and watching. Gotcha. Okay. So look, how to successfully scale a business. You, you're the leader of a company, right? If you're the leader of your company, you need to learn the sort of the 15 points of leadership. So when I, I give leadership seminars often, and I have 15 points of leadership. So I think the first thing a leader needs to understand is how to show vision how to rally the troops and rally the team around a goal and a vision. And we've done that recently by launching a stock option program. So the team is, is and, and again, I think it's part of RevOps as well. We've got everybody aligned around, you know, profitability and goals, right? Pro profitability mm -hmm. and targets. So if, if everybody hits those targets, well, they benefit from it. So that, that's number one. So yeah, which you, which you and I talked about, which we're in the process of rolling out as well. Yeah. Oh, cool. There you go. Yeah. And look, a leader doesn't necessarily have to be a phenomenal salesperson, but they have to be self-aware that if they're not, you better bring in somebody that is because sales and marketing and, and telling you the story is a huge piece of, of growing your business, right? So self-awareness is a big thing on leadership, you know, being surrounded by the right people. Put it, so what is your circle of influence? That's a big piece, right? So if you're hanging around with people that, you know, are consistently talking about goals and dreams and, and vision and and growth, that's how you're going to think. But if you're mm -hmm. going to continually surround yourself with people, well, I don't know about that, or fear, you know, fear-based people, it, that's going to seep into you. So your mm -hmm. circle of influence is absolutely key. You know, how you think, your thought process, the language you use. And I, and I actually go into that, and I'm not, I'm not trying to sell my book at all, but I'm just saying I go into all that in my book on strategies and tips and tricks on how to be a, a more effective leader. Like, how do you speak to your people? Do you speak to them? Do you degrade them when you speak to them or do you, you pump them up? Do you, you know, in, enhance their, their thinking or their thought process? You know, a lot of times, mm -hmm. like, you know, if I go back 12 years, I used to be, I would have to say pretty tough or pretty aggressive verbally. And now, you know, I've, I've definitely tweaked that and it's more empowering and more, you know, of a positive bent than a, than a sort of leadership by fear. You can't, leading by fear does not work any longer. And I could point to many, many coaches in the National Hockey League when I was, when I was back, you know, as an agent a long time ago. It's a totally different mm -hmm. game today. You're not, like, I remember, <laughs> if you have time for another story, I could tell you a story about uh, one of my clients, Andreas Johansson. This kid was, uh, he was on the Swedish national team, drafted by the New York Islanders in, in the second round. This is back in, I want to say it's 1997 or 98. And he came over to mm -hmm. North America and they sent him straight to the minors. And he was playing for a coach who was old school tyrant. Well, this guy had no idea how to, how to handle European players who had talent and skill. And he, he treated him like, 
all the same, like a North American. Well, you have to drop your gloves. You have to fight. Well, that's not what I do. I put the puck in the net. So, but the point is that relationship mm-hmm. didn't work out at all. But once you move the player to another coach, Butch Goring, if you remember him, Butch Goring was, it was a, a player's coach and he understood mm-hmm. how to mentally motivate players in this. So, you know, Johansson goes from a guy who scored, I think, two goals in 30 games with his former team and, and uh, went over to, to play with Butch and he, he scored, a, it was a goal a game for the first, you know, a little while. So it's all mm-hmm. about how you learning how to motivate each individual, learning how to lead with empowering, you know, language and beliefs. So that's kind of one, one main key I want to leave you guys with. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's also why in the last 20 years, because there's so many of those stories, right? We've all heard them both like really close to home and then also, also like in the way you just shared it now. And I think a lot of business leaders, again, whether you're leading the company or, or a department or a division, whatever it is, they started seeing the, the parallels between, you know, coaching sports successfully and, and coaching people on a team doing business. You know, we, we talk about it here all the time at Dynamico, that, you know, this is a team sport. And, you know, so what do you need to do to, to pull the team together Make sure you have all the positions covered so you can succeed as as a team. I mean, of course, there there are a lot of sporting analogies, which of course you can that you know you can get carried away with. But I, I think when it comes to the how you motivate people, uh, I think that's a very powerful thing. So I mean, so you, there was a lot of good stuff in there, and, and I mean, those were essentially all, all tips. But I'm going to ask you anyhow, or do you have another tip that you'd like to you know give our audience around how to how to better you know, assess or align or accelerate their, their, their growth, their profitability, their customer experience or their employee experience. I'm going to get a little esoteric with you. And I'm going to say that as a leader, so I, we have a, like I said, we have this leadership call and we have 51 out of the 300 on the call every week. Right. So cool. the fifth, and, and if you're not on that call, you're not going to grow. You're, you're not going to move up in management. That's for sure. So <laughs> don't expect it. But the point is one of my, I'm going to call it my secret weapon over the last seven years has been in meditation. And a lot of people, you know, look at meditation and think that's weird or that's, you know, sort of in the clouds craziness. But I'm going to tell you meditation is, is my secret weapon from a sense that it's made me focus. It's calmed me down. It's allowed me to see something in front of me and not react and instead think and think logically and then make a decision, not an emotional decision. So that is if you're asking me what my secret weapon is, it's absolutely meditation. I use a, you know, I use a technique called inner engineering. And that's been, mm-hmm. you know, that's allowed me to, again, to, to make decisions not on emotion, but on, on logic and fact. And I used to look, I can go back, you know, 10, 15 years ago where I used to, used to, something would come across my desk and I would immediately explode on it and make a, an emotional decision. It would be often the wrong decision. Totally. So, I mean, meditation has been a powerful tool for, for a, while, a while now. You know, it feels like it's been at least 10 or 20 years since it, be, it started becoming a trend and, it's, and, it, and it only continues to grow. Because of that, you hear about different ways to achieve the same results from meditation other than, because when people haven't done it before, they, they don't, they were like, what does it even mean? Do you go to sit in a quiet room and put your finger and thumbs together and, and kind of, you know, but, but, if, but you hear more and more how people explain things like flow, right? So what do you need to do to get into a state of flow? You know, for some people it's, you know, I go for a run or I, I go to the sauna for 25 minutes and I, and it's the things that I go through when I'm in the sauna, which is one of the things that I do, or, you know, whatever that sort of activity is like for me, snowboarding, I wish I could do it more, more frequently, but that's when I'm, you know, in my, in the zone. So there's lots of things you can do to have the same effect. That's right. So you look, look, you can go for walks, right? I, I'm now living in Florida. I was living in Canada where I had the same temperature as you did. So you, you couldn't often go for walks, but, but here I can go for yeah. walks all the time. So walking, you know, clears your, your brain. I mean, Steve Jobs spoke about walking all the time and the founder of the Huffing, Huffington Post, she Ariana Huffington, Ariana, she talks about, yeah. she talks about walking and how walking gets you into a flow state. So walking is a great way to do that. Running as well, going to the gym, but also sitting in a quiet space and following your breath. That's another way to do it. I mean, there's, there's many ways to do it, but I think, you know, those three or four tips are, are great ways to get into that flow state. Yeah. 
That's a great tip. And of course, it's most helpful for the people who are running 100 miles an hour, right? Who That's right. They're, that's their, that is their biggest strength, but their biggest weakness is that they're not patient enough to bring everyone else along for the journey. That's correct. Mark, that was that was awesome. Thanks so much. I'm, I'll make sure we share the lucky, the lucky formula. And also, what, what is the best way for people to connect with you? I'm on Instagram. It's called Mr. Lucky Official. So at Mr. Lucky Official on Instagram. And actually, if I could leave you with a uh, with a quiz, can I uh, can I leave you guys Please. with a gift? Your your followers with a gift. So I've got a a lucky Absolutely. quiz. I call it. So you can take the lucky quiz at theluckyformula.com slash quiz. Again, theluckyformula.com slash quiz. And that gives you that, that rates your lucky score. So it spits out a score between zero and a hundred and that's your mm-hmm. lucky score. So how, how like, how lucky are you? How successful are you? Or how likely to be successful are you is what it, and, and it gives you tips and tricks on how, how to increase your, your ability to attract or, or catch luck. Awesome. I, that, that's a, that's a great way to, to end this. Mark, thanks so much. That was a, a great conversation. I, and I look, I look forward to another opportunity to get together. Awesome. Brandon, thank you very much for your time. It was great. Yeah, take care. Thank you for checking out this episode of RevOps Champions. This show is powered by Dynamico, a HubSpot consulting firm helping businesses level up the technology systems that power their ability to scale. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow RevOps Champions wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Or visit RevOpsChampions.com to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes.